Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4. Go ahead and turn there, Matthew chapter 4. Go ahead and turn there. Um, man, I love what we're going to talk about today. Uh, let's jump into it. I got to move quick. Um, let, me, let me start off by asking you like a serious, legitimate question, a question that we should probably ask ourselves every morning. And the question is this, how do you know you're not crazy? How do you know you're not crazy? <laughs> I mean, that's one of those questions where it's like the more you think about it, the more like, the more you got a new thing to be afraid about. Um, let, let me let me tell you why why I'm asking this question. I came upon this meme or this inspirational quote on social media this week. It's from C.S. Lewis, and he says, "When the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite uh, the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind." Now, I think that's true. And that's like really cute. And that sounds like something C.S. Lewis probably would say. But in real life, like the cliff is kind of like metaphorical, right? Like it's not always easy to see where the cliff is. So when some people are running this direction and some people are running this direction, how do you know you're running in the right direction? How do you know you haven't lost your mind? <laughs> the sermon. Yeah, that's what both sides say, man. You know what I'm saying? You know, how do we know? How do we know? How do we know? Or let me, let me get more specific. How do we know that we're doing the most loving thing possible? How do we even know that we are loving, right? I mean, every single person in the world is going to say that they value love. How do you know that you're actually loving, okay? And so, like, that's what I want us to explore today. So we're going to jump right in. Matthew chapter 4, this is one of, I, I love what we're going to talk about today. So anyway, all right, Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, I want to encourage you to take notes. A short pencil has a long memory. Today, lunch is, it's fast, it's a drive through okay? I'm, we're going to give you the word, and then you're going to have to eat it at home. So, so take notes so that you can review this stuff and pray about it uh, throughout the afternoon and this week. So no further ado, let's jump in. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. You ever read the Bible and you're like, yeah, I might could have figured that one out. You know, he's hungry. He hasn't eaten 40 days. He's hungry. All right, verse 3. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, church, can Jesus make bread? Absolutely, some of his greatest miracles. But look how he responds, verse four. But Jesus told the devil, no. The scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, the devil said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. All right, this is the scripture for today. Um, let, me, let me explain where we're headed. Today, we are continuing our series, Hug the Cactus. Hug the Cactus is about six spiritual disciplines needed to have a vibrant, a vibrant, growing relationship with Jesus, right? So when we started this church, we asked ourselves, what should a Jesus follower be doing, all right? And what we came up with is we came up with these six spiritual disciplines. Last week, we talked about loving the people in a small group, all right? I hope you're getting to do that. Today, we're going to talk about, I think, is the most important one. Today, the spiritual discipline is I read the Bible daily, I read the Bible daily, okay? Uh, now, this, this is so critical. If you're like, Tim, um, I'm not going to do anything you say. I'll only do one of them, okay? I'm not going to do all six of those things. I'll only choose one. I actually prefer misery. Uh, I would rather be, uh, i just rather have a miserable life. I'm only going to do one of those. Which one should I do? I would tell you, you should do the one we're going to talk about today. You should read the Bible daily because all the other spiritual disciplines flows out of this one. If you can get this one right, all these other good things are going to happen. Reading the Bible daily is the keystone habit for a Jesus follower, all right? So let's get into three principles that are just as relevant today as they've ever been. Number one, don't guess at what the Bible says. 
Don't guess at what the Bible says, all right? Know what the Bible says. Don't guess at what the Bible says. The Bible, listen carefully, the Bible was written to be understood, okay? Like, it's not some sort of, like, weird code that you got to crack, all right? You don't need a PhD to understand this. This was written so that you could understand it. If you were stranded on an island, you've never heard about God before, but you found this Bible, you would have everything you need to know who God is, who you are, and what you've been told to do, okay? Like, like it, it, it's, it, it, there's nothing too magical about this, like, in the sense of understanding it. It was written to be understood, all right? Now, you may be here, and you may be a skeptic, and you may be asking the right question. And the right question is, why should I care about the Bible? Why should I read the Bible? Why should I not just guess at what it says? Why do I need to know what it says? Uh, let, let me say it like this. Um, you need to know what the Bible says simply because of its claim. The Bible claims that there is a God, all right? The Bible also claims that this God is good and he created you. And he created you for a purpose, and the Bible tells you what that purpose is. The Bible also claims that it tells you what we should believe and how we should act. The Bible also claims that our good God is coming back and will hold every single one of us accountable whether or not we have done what he has revealed to us. All right? That's quite the claim. Even if you're not on board with Jesus yet, I want to invite you to read the Bible. Anything making that kind of claim should at least be explored, and then you can ascertain if you believe it or not, all right? Now, what you might be hearing is a pastor on stage telling you to read, read the Bible. So let me, let, me, let me try to illustrate this differently. Anybody watch the football game last night? The football game? Come on, roll tide, anybody? All right, roll tide. Uh, <laughs> uh, just, I want you to imagine, like, like, just at the height of the excitement, what if there was, like, breaking news? And the game was taken off air and like the news was on air. And what they're reporting is that aliens just landed on planet Earth, all right? Right here. And they're like really cool aliens, like super happy, super chill. Um, like, like we like these aliens, okay? And like the reporters are just talking about these aliens and the aliens are like, hey, we've got a message for you. Like, like we've come here to told you something. We created a website. And we have put all this information about our universe on that website. And we want to invite all humans to go and read it. Now, now, let me ask you, would you at some point read that? Like, listen, everybody last night was like, maybe after the game, but not now. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, no. Like, at some point, we're, we're curious. It could be a hoax. It may not be true, but we want to explore it for ourselves because that's a claim. That's quite the claim that these aliens came down here to tell us how the universe works. Let's at least see if we agree with it, okay? Well, that's not too far from what Jesus has done for us. Jesus came down to us and revealed all this stuff to us. And it's God. You know, sometimes we get like this thing like, hey, you can't see God. That's true today. But that wasn't always true. There was a time when like Jesus walked among us. So you could put your arms around him. You could sniff Jesus if, if that was <laughs> something you wanted to do, right? You, you could do those things. And he told us these things. And so even if you don't agree with it, you should at least explore to see if the claims are true. So that, that's why I think every one of us should, should not just guess what the Bible says. Not just take somebody else's word for it. Don't take my word for it. Don't take YouTube's word for it. Don't take Hollywood's word for it. You, like, you figure out what it says. So let me give you three ideas on how to understand the Bible. Number one, number one, read the whole thing. Read the whole thing. Make a commitment to read the whole thing. If you've only read bits and pieces of it, then you don't understand the bits and pieces you probably have read. I mean, you might have a basic understanding, but there's a lot more to be understood. All right? Uh, second thing, study it. Like, don't just read it, but study it. Like, like look underneath uh, the surface. Yes, it was written to be understood. Yes, it was written 2,000 to 3,500 years ago, depending on which letter you're, you're, you know, you're, you're reading. And it was written on the other side of the earth, <laughs> okay? So, like, yeah, we need to study to be sure that we're not just guessing at the meaning, all right? Some things have been lost on us, right? Sometimes when the scripture uses an idiom, we got to do some digging in to figure out what does that mean, right? Can you imagine archaeologists 2,000 years from now wondering what in the world did those Alabamians mean when they said it's raining cats and dogs? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what, huh? Like, right, we got to dig in to be sure that we can understand it properly, but do the hard work. How do you study it? A couple things. One, um, this is, this is going to sound like a bad joke. It's not a bad joke. When I've got questions about the Bible, you want to know what I do? I Google it. Google it. You're reading something, something doesn't make sense to you, you don't understand it, take the verse that you're reading and Google it. What does Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 really mean? Google it. 
uh, look at the top few like results and, and just see like and listen there's a lot of nuts out there right there's probably a lot of 12 year olds blogging you know trying to pose as an expert I don't know read a few until you're hearing the same thing over and over that's where you that's where you start to realize like hey I'm probably landing on the meaning of this all right or use my favorite bio, uh, my favorite uh, website for this biblehub.com biblehub.com they've got incredible resources for free for you to use uh, I don't even think you have to log in you can just go to the website type in the page uh, type Type in the, the verse that you want to study, and it's going to give you all these incredible resources. Uh, by the way, as a pastor, I've spent thousands of dollars on, on Bible study tools and resources, and what BibleHub.com offers for free is 99% plus as good as anything I've paid money for. So if you're, if you're trying to study it, man, get on there. And then three, ask good questions. Um, anybody here, you ever read something, and then five minutes later, you forgot what you just read? Come on, man, probably all of us, right? Me too, me too. So ask good questions after reading the Bible. Here are four questions. I apologize for a list within a list, but here we go. Four questions to ask after reading the Bible. So let's say, I'm not talking about like ultimately reading the Bible, uh, not when you finish the whole thing, but when you finish a chapter, ask these four questions. From what I just read, how can I praise God? From what I just read, how do I, what, I'm sorry, what do I need to confess? From what I just read, what can I be thankful for? From what I just read, what do I need to ask God on my behalf based upon reading this chapter? If you'll ask yourself those four questions when finishing a chapter, one, your understanding of that chapter is going to be uh, deepened, and you're going to be able to retain it a lot longer. All right, now I'm going to say a couple of important things before we move on here. Um, going back to Matthew chapter 4, Something really, really important. I want to be sure we do not miss this. Jesus was tempted by Satan three times, and all three times he responded the same way. He responded with Scripture. It's fascinating. Now, I want you, if you follow Jesus, I want you to ask yourself the question silently in your heart. <laughs> the last time you were tempted, how did you respond to it? Many times when we're tempted, we either start rationalizing, or we give in to it, or we just dwell on it. Um, or we can pray about it, and that's, that's an okay thing. But look what Jesus did. Jesus responded with Scripture all three times. So I want to challenge you. Next time you feel tempted, respond immediately with Scripture. If, you, if you're new to reading and studying the Bible, just Google. Hey, I'm feeling tempted to do this. What is, what, what, give me some Bible verses about this temptation, and you're going to find like a bunch of good ones, all right? Um, the, the other, one other really important thing I want to say here, and... Um, and, and, and this is so important, guys, and I want you to hold me accountable to this as a pastor. If you're ever at a church and the pastor is promising the things to you that Satan promised Jesus, it's time for you to find a new church. All right, let me say that one more time. If you're ever at a church and the pastor is promising you things that Satan promised Jesus, you're in the wrong place. All right? Now, if that's here at Essential, please come talk to me first before you leave. Uh, you don't have to leave, lady. Uh, look, come talk to me. Come, ta come talk to me. Come talk to me. Come talk. Just be sure there's not a misunderstanding. But the three things, the three things that we see Satan offering Jesus is power, like the power to control things, money, and popularity. And if you ever hear a pastor or a religious person promising those three things, if you'll follow Jesus, you could be in the middle of a trap. All right, so be careful of that. All right, with that said, let's move to number two. Let me make everybody uncomfortable. The Bible saves us. The Bible saves us. Um, who here agrees with that? Does the Bible save us? Okay, me, me, me and you. All right, the Bible saves us. Um, here's what I mean by that. I'm going to stand by that statement, but here's what I mean by it. The word save is used in three different ways in the Bible. Uh, the biblical writers say that we were saved right? When you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you were saved from the penalty of your sins. And the fancy theological term for that, any, any nerds here, what's the fancy theological term? Justified. Justified. When you placed your faith in Christ, you were justified before God. You were saved. The second one is you're being saved. You're being saved. The fancy theological word for that is sanctification. All right? And the third use is that you will be saved. All right? Fancy word for that is glorified. One day you will be saved from living in a fallen world and you will 
be glorified, all right? So we were saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. One reason the Bible is so important is that the Bible is instrumental in that second one, being saved, right? Uh, it's, it's instrumental in being sanctified. And we are sanctified each day as God makes us into the man or woman he'd have us become. Uh, look, look what 2 Timothy 3.16 says. It says, all scripture, how many of the scriptures? All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. The God uses, the Holy Spirit uses the scripture to sanctify us, to save us, all right? That middle saving, all right? Now, how do we do that? Like, like how, do we, uh, how do we cooperate with that? Like, how do we cooperate with the Holy Spirit using scripture to sanctify us? Well, we don't just listen to the Bible. We don't just read the Bible. We do what the Bible says, all right? We do what the Bible says. We don't just listen. We do what the Bible says. Um, uh, Nike. Anybody wear Nikes? Anybody got any Nike shoes at home? All right, all right. We would never have heard of the company Nike if their mission statement, if their slogan was, just think about it. You know what I'm saying? Well, nobody would ever heard about it. Like, just think about it. What kind of slogan is that? No, the slogan is just do it. And kind of the same thing with the scripture. Like, we're, we're not being given the scripture just to contemplate it all the time. Yes, we should contemplate it, but that contemplation needs to lead to action. Let me support this biblically. Uh, John, I showed the scriptures. John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. That's an action, obey or James 1, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Uh, there's a little quote. This is in my notes, but uh, there's, there's a quote. You've probably seen this. I, I think I've used it before. Um, the average Christian American is 31, I'm sorry, 30,000 Bible verses overweight. <laughs> You know what that I means? There's 31,000 31, Bible verses in the Bible, and the average American Christian uh, is taking a lot more in than they're doing. You know what I'm saying? And we've kind of gained, we're getting a little chubby spiritually, okay? And so we need to counter that by doing what we have heard. So let me give you three steps to apply the Bible. How do, how do we apply this to our life? Number one, show it. Um, after reading, let's see. Eh, go back one. Nope, that, no, no, go forward one. I should never doubt you. Sorry, Juan. Number one, after reading a chapter, ask, how can I apply this today? All right? How can I apply this today? Like, I just read this chapter. Like, what does that mean for me today? And I want to encourage you to say yes to whatever it's saying, right? Don't, don't just say, like, I don't know if I'm going to follow it or not. Say yes before you read it. And then as you read it, ask, like, man, how can I apply this today? Uh, the second one, read the Bible with your calendar nearby. If, if you want to do more than just hear the word, you want to do the word, have your calendar nearby. Uh, there's a little phrase that I believe with all my heart, and it's, if, it's, if it's not on the calendar, it ain't happening, all right? And there'll be times where I'll be reading the scripture, and I, I feel that little tug of the Holy Spirit, a little nudge of the Holy Spirit. Hey, go do that thing. Go do that thing. But then I, I keep reading the Bible, and I read the next chapter, or maybe a, a different chapter, and then I, I finish my time with the Lord, and the kids need something, and then I, you know, I, I get to work, and I get busy. And if I'm not careful, I'll forget about that little nudge I sensed when reading the Bible. So, so what I do now is whenever I'm reading the Bible, I use a, a physical copy like this, but then I got my calendar nearby. And if I, if I sense that the Holy Spirit's nudging me to do something, I immediately stop what I'm doing. I pull out my calendar, and I say, Lord, I sense you're doing this. Here's when I'm going to do it. And I put it on my calendar, what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it. I want to encourage you to, to, I'm going to invite you to do that with me. And the number three is this, trust the Bible more than you trust you. All right. If you want to apply the word, trust the Bible more than you trust you. Now, listen carefully. What I'm not saying, I am not saying we should check our brains at the door. I am saying nothing is more easily deceived than your heart. All right? Don't check your brain at the door, but have some humility to know that the human heart is easily deceived. So each one of us needs that discernment on, on how, how do we navigate this, right? I'm hearing something, and it's it, like the way I think, the way I think, uh, feel is a little bit different than what the Bible's saying. What I'm asking you to do is trust the word more than you trust yourself. Don't check your brain at the door. Be sure that you're understanding what it's saying, right? Be sure you haven't just misinterpreted it. 
Do a little study on it. Do a little digging on it. Be sure you actually know what that author meant to the original audience, right? Like know what the verse means, but then do it. Because remember, the human heart is easily deceived. All right, I think I got one more thing on this one. Um, oh, man, a trap here, a trap. A warning here. Show, show, show Star Wars. Um, the, the devil's schemes are, like, are always the same, all right? The devil's schemes are always the same. And like the temptation since the beginning in Genesis chapter uh, 3 was when, when Satan asked Eve in the Garden of Eden, Satan asked Eve, did God really say that? Did God really say that? Did God really say you can't eat that fruit? And Satan does the same thing today. There are going to be times when you're reading a scripture and you feel like, man, this is pretty simple. Like, I know I need to do this. But then, but then like, that little voice inside the head starts saying, like, well, is that what God's really saying? Hey, don't fall for the devil's trap on that. Uh, uh, one of the hallmarks of Satan is to take a simple instruction from the Lord and make it complicated. Don't fall into that trap. Please don't fall into that trap. All right. Uh, one last nugget here. Uh, if you, all right, one last nugget here. Uh, when it talks about doing the word of God, you need to know who you are. And you need to know who you aren't. All right? Uh, something shocking about our scripture here in Matthew chapter 4 is two out of the three temptations. Two out of three temptations. Satan starts the temptation by saying, if you are the son of God, then do that. If you are the son of God, then do this. Was Jesus the son of God? Absolutely. But Satan was coming at his identity. And if Satan did it to him, he's going to do it to you too. It doesn't matter who the world says you are. <laughs> it doesn't matter who Satan says you are. It really honestly doesn't even matter who you say you are. What matters is who your loving creator says you are. He created you and he designed you for a purpose and he has plans for you. His opinion is the one that matters. All right? So another reason, like we get into the scripture, is so that we can know who we are. All right? Otherwise, you are vulnerable. If you are guessing what the Bible says, and you're like, man, I don't know, maybe, maybe Hollywood's right about who I am. Maybe my favorite athlete or pop star is right about who I am. Maybe my own gut's right about who I am. Man, if you're like that, you, 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 you are lost. You got to know the scripture so that you can know who you are and who you're not. All right, let's keep moving. Number three, cling to the Bible like your life depends on it. Cling to the Bible like your life depends on it. When we read the scripture, do not fall into another trap of just seeing it as a historical document. Is it, is it, uh, 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 is it um, accurate historically? Yes, incredibly accurate. But it's more than a historical document. This is our survival document. These are our, our instructions from God on who we are and what we are to do until he returns. All right, this is our survival document to get through all the things life throws at us. Now, let me poke on two types of people, all right? Let me, let me see if I can kind of make us all angry before, before I'm done here. Let, let, me, let me poke on the secular person first, the secular person. Um, my question for you is, who are you trusting your existence with? Or what are you trusting your existence with? And here's why I want to bring this up. One of the things that I hear um, a lot, and people use slightly different phrases for it, but, but we've all heard the phrase. Somebody says, hey, you know what? I'm not, I'm not a person of faith. I, I identify as a person of science, and I only believe what I can see and what I can test and those sort of things. If that's you, and that's common. If you're, if you're watching online and that's you, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. Um, here's what I'm going to say about this. I, like Tim, like I love science. I hope everybody at our church loves science. I hope you guys are all getting better at science. I hope my, my six-year-old in the front row, I hope she grows up to be a scientist. I love science. I love science. Science is an awesome thing. We live in a science city, and I love that. Science is at its best when it is exploring and discovering God's creation. Science is at its worst when it's trying to supplant God, all right? Here's a problem. Science was not designed to answer certain questions that we're trying to make it answer. For instance, one thing we know from science is that something can't come from nothing. Science is not designed to answer that question, well, then where did it all start? What was the first mover? 
That's a question that science will never be able to answer for us. Another question that science just is not designed to answer is, who are we? What are we supposed to really be doing? Science can't answer those questions. Science can answer a lot of great questions. I love science. Love science. But it can't answer some of these questions. Now, let, let, me, let me take it one step further. Here's, here's something that I think is really, really dangerous for us. When we say that I believe in science, not faith, or I believe in science more than faith, what we're actually saying is that I believe we as humans will figure out all of our own problems. I think as humans, we will find solutions for our problems. And we use science, that word that we all like, to basically say we don't need God. And so if you're here today and you're like, man, I lean towards science, not God, my question for you is, do you think you're independent from God? Do you, do you, have you turned your back on God? Because that, that, is, that is like the attitude that God disciplines the most in Scripture. Love science, but be sure you have it ordered correctly. God first, and then science, all right? Now, let me, let me, let me, poke, on, let me poke on my spiritual friends. If, if you're here, if you love Jesus, I'm about to talk about you, okay? Um, and here, here's what I want to say to you. Um, I've been following Jesus for nearly 30 years now. And over those 30 years, I've had a lot of friends who've started with Jesus and have, and, and have walked away from God. And I have seen one variable that's common with all of them. One variable. And that variable has got two facets. Either they do one or, one or the other or both. Some of the people who started with Jesus, walked away with Jesus, they just never read the Bible. They just never read the Bible. Maybe they grew up in a de denomination or a church or whatever, and reading the Bible just really wasn't important to them, right? And so, like, the first trial comes, the first attack from Satan comes, and they're defenseless. They have no idea what God's revealed to us, and they fall away. The second group, and this is going to be the one that's going to be far more common for us at Essential. I've seen too many people fall away from the Jesus because they stopped taking the Bible straight, Instead, they started mixing the Bible with other things. Here's what I mean by that. Instead of just reading the scripture by itself, they maybe read the scripture, but they found something they didn't like, and it kind of rubbed them the wrong way, and they just started saying, you know, there's no way that's true. This can't be right. I don't like that. That doesn't fit in with my worldview. And so what they do is, instead of reading the Bible, they find a devotional, or they find other authors who mix in a little bit of scripture with their philosophy, and now you have switched to reading these devotionals that kind of talk about the Bible, but they aren't the Bible because that author's opinion is more in line with your opinion. If I'm describing you, you are not years away, you are months away from rejecting Christ. I'm serious. I've seen it over and over and over and over are devotionals awesome? Some of them, yes. Are books awesome? Yes. Dare I say, I read more books about the Bible than anybody else in this room. I love that. That's valuable. But church, I am begging you, do not let those supplemental materials supplant the word of God in your life. Let those supplemental materials supplement your understanding and your reading and your devotion of God, but don't let them take the place. Get the word straight. We've got to get to the place where we can open this up and figure out how to read it and apply it for ourselves. So I'm begging you, please don't be another statistic who falls away from the faith because you decided you didn't like the Bible and you'll just read somebody else's opinion about the Bible. All right, let me give you four principles to read the Bible like your life depends on it. Let it read you. Man, for so much of my life, I have come to the Bible and I judge the Bible. <laughs> I judge whether or not I like this. <laughs> Well, I'll hear what you got to say, Lord. Let me, let me see what you got here, and then I'll decide if it's good or bad. And if it's good, I'll do it. Don't do that. That's pride. That's a problem, okay? No, no, no. We come to the Bible, and we allow the Bible to judge our hearts, to judge our minds and our actions. We don't come to the Bible to judge it. And in fact, uh, I like how we're there. It's like we're not coming here so much to read it. We're coming to it so it can read us, all right? Number two, read the Bible five times a week. If you're wondering, like, hey, what, what's, the, what's the gold standard? Read it five times a week. I had a mentor of mine say, aim for seven, hit five. So tell yourself, be committed. Like, hey, I'm going to read the Bible every, every morning. But then if you wake up late or you didn't sleep well or you wake up to a crisis, then it's all right, you miss a couple. But be sure you're getting into the Bible five times a week. 
Next, follow a plan, not just willy-nilly. Don't just open this thing up and read randomly. If you do that, you're gonna read a lot of stuff over and over and over again and miss a whole lot of stuff. Find a Bible reading plan. I love our daily Bible reading plan. You can find this guide uh, near the TVs on the back wall, free to you, of course. Um, yes, it's dated, but it's not, it doesn't have the years on it, right? So just pick up today on whatever day it is today, September something. And then when January 1 rolls around, just flip to the next page and start on January 1 and keep going, right? Get into a plan. And number four, commit parts to memory. If you're here today and you're a Jesus follower and you're like, man, Tim, I already know a lot of this stuff, I bet, I bet a lot of us could do a little bit better when it comes to committing some scriptures to memory. That's not a command from the Lord, but it is incredibly helpful. So, so if, we, if we take everything, if we take everything that we've uh, talked about today, I think, I think I can sum it up in three statements. The Bible, know it, apply it, cling to it. Now, let me circle back to the beginning. Remember that C.S. Lewis quote? How do you know you're not crazy? Guys, it seems like the world is crazy. It doesn't seem like it. The world is crazy. And what makes it so crazy is that the world has completely untethered itself from what God has revealed to us. You want to be sure you're not crazy? Keep yourself tethered to the word of God. There is a good God who created you, he sustains you, he's told you to do things, and he is coming back soon. Stay tethered to what he's told you to do. You do that, and you won't ever be crazy. Why don't you look at somebody and say, you're not too crazy. You're not too crazy. You're not too crazy. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. You're not too crazy. All right. Let me ask you the most, let me ask you. Let me ask you the most important thing. Do you know Jesus? Do you have peace with God? If you're watching online, do you have peace with God? Uh, I want to do something a little bit different here. Um, I want to be sure that everybody here has peace with God, and I want you to hear it straight from the Bible on how to be right with God. If you have a guilty conscience, if you have a stinking suspicion that you may be on your way to hell, listen up carefully. Romans chapter 3, let's kick it off like this. The scripture says, the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. How many people are righteous on their own? No one, no one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one, for everyone has sinned. How many people have sinned? Everybody, me, you, all of us. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And that's a problem. Why? For the wages of sin is death. What does that mean? Does it mean you die in this life? Yes, we all die in this life. It means more than that. It means hell. It means death spiritually in the life to come. But the free gift of God, how much does that cost? How much does that gift cost us? Free. It's free to us. Is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Christ didn't come to us because we were good people. Christ came to us because we were dead in our sins. Romans chapter 10, if, listen so carefully. If you want to be right with God, get this one right. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Next. Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. I love this next one. Romans 8, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And one more great one. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You want to be made right with God? You want to finally deal with that guilty conscience? That's how you do it. Look how you can respond today. Five steps. One, admit that you're a sinner. Two, let the ego go. You're jacked up just like the rest of us. <laughs> Admit that you're a sinner. Number two, understand that as a sinner, you deserve death. You deserve hell. 
But number three, believe Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you, not just us collectively. Yes, that's true, but, but you specifically from sin and death. Number four, repent, turn away, turn from your old life of sin to a new life in Christ. And number five, receive through faith in Jesus Christ, his free gift of salvation. Mm-hmm.